was it was full of laughs it was full of help it was emotional it was just a wonderful event and that's what we want to emulate today but um obviously we have to do it virtually because of the year that we've had so uh covid has altered our, our plans but we are proud to host our second event all virtually so this year's theme is forces of change and looking at life after service so today we are honored to be joined by an amazing panel of speakers who are incredibly passionate inspiring and are definitely driving change so we are thrilled to have with us today victoria williams We've got Captain Ian Moore, MBE. We've got Samuel T. Reddy. We've got Andrew Pierce from Communities to Work Plus. Anthony Stephen Malone as well uh, will be, oh, and Johnny, Johnny Mercer, MP, who's going to be joining us a little bit later. So he's going to pop up about halfway through uh, as it's the day before I'm So uh, he's back and forth. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Brian our new center, who many of you will already know and has championed this event. Thank you, Emma. Good morning, everyone. So great to connect with you. As Claire said, the past 60 months, the 180 moment in the way we live, work, and learn. Last year, we couldn't get together to the pandemic, and as we are at the Sorry, Emma, two seconds. Can, can we all make sure to mute the mics, please, if you've joined? Okay. okay. I think Christy might have to mute some at some point if uh, if Christy can do that. There we are. I think it's good to go, Emma. Off you go. Okay. Anyway, as I said, we've had a pretty tough 16 months and the pandemic scuppered a lot of things, but we decided we couldn't go another year without seeing you all. So our veterans event was always about people meeting up and networking and sadly we can't do that face to face. So this virtual event is the safest way to do this for now. Next year, as Claire said, we hope to be out and about again and speaking with you face to face as we did in 2019. Today, we'll hear from people who are driving change for our armed forces and veterans. This idea came about after I attended a number of similar events and joined the Veterans NHS Wales network for several sessions. It was there that I recognised our radio stations could do more, be part of the conversation and give a platform to the issues that matter most to you all. I want to thank you, Jane's legal team, for their support and sponsorship of this day. They were the first organisation I met when I started on this path four years ago. All the speakers today have gone above and beyond to make a difference during a very difficult time in our country's history. Victoria Williams from Veterans Wales NHS Network, I want to thank you for trusting me to have the best interests of all those that serve and allow me to learn more about the work being done to help those suffering from combat stress. We're looking more forward to hearing more about the findings of your research into trauma. We'll hear from former CIA agent Anthony Stephen Malone. Think Homelands and his humanitarian, humanitarian work is equally as extraordinary too. Captain Ian Moore, MB of the 3rd Battalion, the Royal Welsh, will reveal what his team have been up to during Operation COVID and talk about the Armed Forces Covenant, which marked 10 years this week. Congratulations to all those involved with that. Communities for Work Plus will highlight the options open to those as part of resettlement and transition to civvy life. And the spotlight has also been on Commonwealth veterans Right now, Samuel T. Reddy will be sharing his experiences and the work to support the Bain community and his connection with the Tri Forces. And finally, during our many meetings, one name came up constantly, and that was the then Veterans Minister, Johnny Mercer. We all have questions for him. He's left government and sees himself these days as more of a campaigning MP. I'm grateful that he'll be joining us at this virtual event on the eve of Armed Forces Day. Thank you, Claire. <coughs> Oh, thank you so much, Emma. So we have to say a massive thank you to Simon, Francesca and the fabulous team from Hugh Jane Solicitors, who are our proud supporters for the second year running. So we give a special thanks to you and have made this event possible. Um, I'd like to introduce Simon Ellis. Thank you, Claire. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, can I also add my own personal welcome to the second veterans event? Uh, it's fantastic to see so many familiar names on the list of attendees today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Simon Ellis. I'm a partner and head of the military department at Hugh James. As a firm, we're proud supporters of the armed forces and veteran community. Uh, it's been a privilege to work with many of you on various events and initiatives to help support uh, military personnel. It's always been very clear to me that military personnel often have specialist uh, and sometimes unique legal issues to deal with. 
uh, and we pride ourselves on offering legal advice and assistance specifically tailored to those from a military background. I think when Emma first spoke to me about launching a Veterans Day at the Liberty Stadium in Swansea, and that was probably about two and a half years ago now, um, it sounded like an absolutely fantastic idea and we jumped at the chance. But I don't think any of us really realised just how well that event would go. Um, I can still remember one veteran who left his home for the first time in ages to attend that event. Um, and he said it was the catalyst that made him leave his home and would hopefully encourage him to do so again. I can also remember one of the presentations prompting a number of former military personnel um, who weren't in a very good place and needed some help uh, to reach out and seek that help for the first time. And that's something that probably wouldn't have happened uh, without the event. So it was all a very humbling uh, and powerfully re powerful reminder of why we all do what we do. Putting on a second event and helping to support that was always going to be something we wanted to do. Um, sadly, COVID had other ideas and the national restrictions significantly delayed this. Um, but we do seem to be gradually coming out of the woods um, and it's fantastic to be able to support this event once again. I really look forward to the day we can all meet up in person again, uh, something that I think will be even more important when the national restrictions are completely eased and we can all venture out properly again. One of the final things that we did as a firm before lockdown was to sign up to the Armed Forces Covenant. Um, it was great to receive the award at our offices. It's very hard to believe that exactly one week after that, the entire country locked down uh, and has been so ever since. But I'm proud that since then, we've also been awarded the bronze and the silver certificates, and I'm really looking forward to applying for the gold certification. The Covenant is a very tangible way of showing support for our armed forces community. Uh, I regard it as far more than just a box to be ticked. In signing the Covenant and committing to uphold its values, we made a public promise to put the interests of military personnel and veterans front and centre in everything that we do. And that's a responsibility I take very seriously. I've promoted the benefits and the obligations of signing the Covenant throughout Hugh James, something I'm pleased to say is always involved pushing against an open door. And I'm especially proud of the military veterans and the current and former cadets that work for Hugh James. And I recognise the skill set and benefits they bring to our organisation. I suspect many of you attending today will already have signed up to the Covenant. Um, for those of you thinking of doing so, I can't recommend it enough. It really forces you to look critically at your organisation uh, to recognise the many areas where you are already supporting and promoting military personnel. But just as importantly, it highlights the areas where changes and improvements could be made. And I'm delighted we signed the Covenant. I'd urge anyone thinking about that to seriously consider doing so. So in conclusion, again, very warm welcome to the event today. I hope you enjoy it and find the presentations useful and informative. I really look forward to speaking with you all soon. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. Good luck for the gold. <laughs> Um, so if you want to reach out to Simon or the team, please drop him an email, simon.ellis at hughjames.com. Of course, you can find them online as well. And now we move on to our first speaker, Captain Ian Moore, MBE, Operational Support Service, 3rd Battalion, Royal Welsh. Captain Moore will be discussing the important role the Armed Forces has played during the pandemic as well and explaining what the Armed Forces Covenant is all about. So please welcome Captain Moore. Good, um, I think I'm on the screen. You probably see my my ugly mug and my and my background. Yeah, um, my name is Captain Nemo. I'm from the um, the Third Battalion Royal Welsh, uh, with our headquarters based in Cardiff. Um, uh, as Simon alluded to earlier, uh, who would have thought that March last year um, things would change on a, uh, on a sixpence, literally? Uh, and it was a few days after we'd uh, supported Simon uh, and uh, Hugh James in signing the Covenant that. Um, uh, the, the soldiers are called forward. Now, we as a unit, we are a, a reserve unit in Wales. Many other reserve units in Wales were actually involved in the uh, in the covenant uh, in the uh, COVID process, uh, and and they all paid their part. But we as a as a unit, uh, we mobilised uh, just short of a hundred reserve soldiers. Uh, and the interesting thing about these reserve soldiers, a lot of them had um, civilian jobs, uh, and they're very very supportive civilian employers uh, allowed them to pull away from those uh, civilian jobs. Uh, to support the effort uh, in, in the fight against uh, COVID-19. Now, um, uh, interesting enough, there's, there's obviously a sort of period of time where these, these soldiers have to uh, get into service. And, uh, and because of the, um, uh, 
because of the COVID situation, we couldn't send them to where they normally go. So we even had to uh, do all the administration and processing of the soldiers to get them into service. And it worked an absolute treat. Uh, everyone stepped up uh, and we got them there. So um, early April uh, last year, um, uh, 98 soldiers from the, the Royal Welsh deployed to all sorts of locations around Wales. Um, we had soldiers uh, driving ambulances in North Wales, uh, supporting the ambulance service in South Wales. And um, uh, while this was going on, of course, th their families were at home uh, and they were isolated uh, uh, away from um, uh, from their families. Uh, and they were all based in various locations in, uh, in Wales. Now, um, those 98 personnel uh, allowed 98 uh, members of the NHS to carry on doing the vital important work um, that the NHS is, is, was doing and continues to do now. Uh, and thankfully, we're coming out with the other side of that, uh, that situation. Uh, but during that period of time, they were um, uh, on constant standby. Um, uh, and, like, and like I said, it was be, be it uh, decontaminating ambulances, uh, again, allowing the, the, the ambulance crews who were very busy to have uh, rest and recuperation at their own time, uh, to uh, unloading uh, aircraft uh, in Cardiff Wales Airport. Uh, and during that period of time, uh, in, in, at the beginning with the shortage of PPE, et cetera, uh, they manually unloaded over 10 million items of, uh, of PPE uh, from the planes uh, into the logistics system. Uh, which then went out to the NHS, uh, and as we know, it, it was it was life saving stuff. And um, we can't really thank uh, their their employers enough for for their support. Uh, and as again, as Simon alluded to, the um, uh, the, the covenant system that we've got, uh, you know, as employers, please sign up to it. Uh, and I encourage you that if you have reservists, or even if you just want to support the armed forces, please, please, please uh, sign up uh, to be a, a covenant signatory. The other thing I was going to um, uh, briefly touch on as well is uh, the actual armed forces uh, covenant grant system. Uh, and there are a number of organizations out there that have benefited from the um, uh, the grant system. Um, what I, if possible, um, could we share my uh, my slides, please? Um, I know you said he'd be uh, we'd be able to do it during the presentation. Um, are, are we? Are we there? Thank you very much indeed. I'm doing it for you. Thank you. The background. <clears throat> it's um. It's... Ah, that little spinning circle. Um, I, I've name checked an individual on this slide, uh, and his name is Mr. Uh, Andy Williams, and he's the uh, the staff officer. Uh, a civil servant that works up in the, the brigade headquarters in uh, in 160 Wells Brigade. And him and his team uh, push the Armed Forces Covenant forward uh, as much as possible. Now, what is the Armed Forces Covenant? Again, I've only got about five minutes left, so I'll briefly run through it now. It's a covenant, it's a trust. Uh, there's money in this trust that came from uh, the LIBOR system um, uh, and it's now being used for, for, for sort of charitable work. What it is for is actually written on the screen. They're a charity and, it, uh, and classed as non-departmental public body. Uh, they look after the Armed Forces Covenant Fund, which is about £10 million a year. Um, who can benefit from it? For broad funding themes, non-core healthcare services for veterans. Uh, removing barriers to, 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 to family life, so allowing people to integrate um, uh, should they have issues, uh, offering extra support both in and after service for those that need help. And we've already alluded to the, uh, the Veterans Mental Health Unit. Uh, they've had uh, um, money uh, to support the, uh, the extremely good work with the, the mental health uh, issues that service personnel and veterans have. Um, and it's, it's, it's there as well to integrate military and civilian communities and the other the armed forces community to participate as civilians. Now, last, just before COVID uh, happened, 2019, uh, the Royal Welsh, my own battalion, had an event in Cardiff Castle. And from the Armed Forces Covenant Fund, we managed to secure, secure £8,500 to support that event bringing the, the veterans, the civilians, uh, their families, all their friends into an event inside Cardiff Castle, which gave the, those that attended, because it was a public event as well, an idea of what uh, the armed forces, the veterans and the veterans community need um, uh, uh, out there. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, we do really well in Wales. Uh, and the reason we do really well in Wales is because of Andy and his team. So 
uh, as an example, the Veterans Community Centre programme, um, it says there, repairs to roofs, you know, uh, meeting hats, legion branches, all these sort of things. We have veterans and, and, uh, and we can interface with our civilian um, community as well. 11 applications are approved in Wales. So of the 68 applications across the UK, Wales got nearly 10%. Now, we should be really proud of this, but what we really want to do is, this four nations, United Kingdom, get 25% of that funding. We want it because proportionally, Wales uh, as a country, even though we're quite small, um, we supply nearly 8% of the percent of the total armed forces in Wales, when we're only sort of 4% of the UK population. So we punch above our weight. So we need more of this funding for when our soldiers become veterans and they leave. So of the eight, uh, two and a half, oh, nearly three million pounds allocated, we got nearly 10% of that, um, that money. So next slide, please. Uh, again, re removing the barriers to, uh, to family life. Four applications from Wales went in. Um, 749,000 pounds came to Wales, another 10%. So 60, gra 60 grants awarded nationally. We got uh, of that seven, uh, just over seven million pounds. So 380 odd. And these are funded our regional schools liaison officers. Armed forces personnel don't necessarily live at, uh, in barracks anymore. Their families are detached and live in Wales. Uh, as do reserve personnel, their families, uh, their children go to schools. So, and these children have specific needs and the regional uh, schools liaison officers help these children in the schools with additional funding, support and, and school awareness. And if a school has service children there, they can apply for additional funding. So it's another uh, marker for the schools to be supportive of the armed forces. Next slide, please. Um, forces together, uh, 2020, we had 13 applications in Wales of the 100. Uh, applications nationwide and again over 10 percent and a, an incredible initiative in uh, in park prison um supporting the uh the service veterans there sadly we, there is a statistic that um uh veterans do uh, end up in the criminal justice system and any support we can give them they need it uh so national allocation was just under 900,000 we got uh, again 10 percent so well done to the team but Unless you, as organisations, are applying for those grants uh, via Andy and his team at the, at the Brigade Headquarters, we can't get them. Uh, and the, the next slide, please. So, in total, then, since uh, 2016, Wales has had over uh, £6 million in Covenant funding. Um, and as I, as, as I said earlier, if you haven't applied for a grant yet, why not? Get in there. The systems are there. Emma's got my details. I can give you the details of the point of contact in the in the uh, headquarters in Brecon where you can apply. Go onto the um, uh, .gov.uk, just type in Armed Forces Covenant and everything you need is on there. But if you need any specific help and guidance, Andy uh, is your man and as a secondary, I can help you out. I think, Emma, that's my last slide. I think it is, yeah. So, um, I was asked to sort of uh, uh, allude to some of the stuff that I have done in, in the past and, uh, and that's specific, specifically supporting uh, Armed Forces families. Uh, and the reason, one of the reasons I got my, uh, my award was in the early uh, noughties when things were pretty difficult in the Middle East, uh, there were a number of service casualties and we realised that the system to support the families of uh, those who were sadly bereaved or received severe injuries or, or actually, like I said, paid the ultimate sacrifice needed changing. Uh, and over a period of time, um, with service families actually lost uh, loved ones uh, or were injured uh, in consultation, then we changed the system. Hence the um, Royal, now Royal Wooden Bassett, uh, the sort of service packages that now individuals now get are way, way better than a, than a crusty old uh, lieutenant colonel knocking on your door and saying, sadly, your son has died or your daughter has died and then walking away. All those packages are now in place. Uh, and I'm really, really proud of the fact that... Um, uh, me uh, and a number of others uh, helped support that uh, that effort and made the system what it is today. And it is world leading. Other other countries look at how we do our casualty notification, as it's called, uh, and they admire what we do. So that was nine minutes and fifty seven seconds. So Emma, I hope I've done my bit. That was incredible. Thank you, uh, Captain Ian Moore. That was perfectly timed. And we're running a little bit ahead, which is brilliant because that leaves us more time for questions later. So that's fantastic. So thank you again, Captain Moore. 
So our next speaker is Victoria Williams, um, um, is Veterans Clinical Lead. Oh, we need everybody to mute their microphones if they're joining, if that's possible, please. Thank you. And uh, obviously, um, hide, your, hide your screen too. So our next speaker is Victoria Williams, uh, the Veterans Clinical Lead for Swansea Bay and Veterans NHS Wales. And she's a, mini a military mental health and trauma specialist. Victoria has been conducting research with veterans on combat PTSD. She'll be sharing her exclusive finding, uh, findings with us on understanding combat trauma, its impact and the recovery. So looking at isolation, loss of identity and finding a purpose, please welcome Victoria Williams. Thank you very much. I'm gonna try and share my slides myself, so please bear with me. Ooh. And... So, can you all see that now? Yes, I think you can. So thank you, my name is Victoria Williams, and um, as been mentioned, I am the clinical lead for Veterans NHS Wales. I'm based in Swansea, and I'm, we cover the Swansea Health Board. I've got 10 minutes, I'm pressing start on my timer. So in 10 minutes, firstly, I really need to thank Emma for asking me to attend today. She's an amazing woman who goes out way beyond what you would expect of someone to do to put this event towards to get today. So well done, Emma, and thank you very much. I'm going to talk, and I'm a big talker, so I'm going to keep it as brief as I can about quickly what Veterans NHLs what Veterans NHLs is and what we can do to what we can offer, what combat trauma is. What is EMDR in case you've never heard of it? And then we're going to look at my research findings. OK, so Veterans NHS Wales, we are, as the name suggests, based in the NHS. There's one of us in every health board throughout Wales. The good thing about our service is we're open access. And what that means is you do not have to go to your GP to get access to our service. If you Google Veterans Wales, it will come up with the link and you can be referred directly through the website. Here's how our board, here's how the health boards in Wales look, and you'll see that there's one of us in every health board. So I work with Rebecca O'Dowd, she's the veteran therapist that works with us, and we've got a secretary, Anna, and she's absolutely brilliant. If you've got any questions, any queries, any worries, come to us and we can ever help you. Okay, so what is combat PTSD? So there's a couple of things I need to say to you now. So that's firstly, not everyone that goes to war or goes joins the military will develop PTSD. Secondly, those that do develop PTSD or symptoms of PTSD, it's a normal reaction to an abnormal event. And I've starred that and I'm going to say it again. This is a normal reaction to an abnormal event. So a lot of people feel a lot of uh, why can't I work this on myself? Why, why am I feeling this way? And actually, it's because you've gone through an event that most of us don't ever have to experience. PTSD is also known, or it used to be known as shell shock or combat stress. So when you've experienced or witnessed people experiencing a life threatening event, this is when PTSD can start to occur. So what we're looking at is these four main symptoms. So that sense of being on guard all of the time, feeling jumpy on on edge getting uh, recurring traumatic reminders of the event. And that's not just flashbacks, that's triggers, that's um, certain images that might pop into your head, that's nightmares, that's all of that stuff. Then we've got extreme avoidance of the things that remind you of the events. So when we're talking about avoidance of things that remind you, we're looking at certain noises, certain smells, um, fireworks, when cars backfire, it's all of that kind of stuff. It's that stuff that we're trying to avoid. Also, we tend to avoid people, we tend to avoid places, we tend to avoid crowds, we tend to avoid supermarkets, anything that makes us feel stressed. So it's bigger than just what you think traditionally would be the things you avoid. And then also you have negative beliefs about yourself. So you develop beliefs that you're not good enough or you should be able to cope with this more or there's something wrong with you. Now, EMDR, for those of you that have never heard of it, it stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. And it's a type of therapy that helps people heal from PTSD. 
And I'd like to thank Prince William for being, Harry, sorry, for being really open and um, talking about the fact that he's had EMDR and it's worked for him. What it basically does in a nutshell is it helps you update and process those memories that are stuck in your brain so that you're able to continue with your life. Now, why am I telling you this? Because there's something called the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, NICE. They are the people that guide us about the best evidence that we should be using for in therapy. So they do lots of different things, but in our in our area, it's about what's best for PTSD. Now, in 2018, it says 16, but it's 18, they downgraded EMDR for combat trauma. And that really annoyed me because I'm an EMDR consultant. I've been using it for years and I know that it works. So because it annoyed me so much, I decided to do some research. And my research is specifically on asking the veterans experience. So it's great we've got these academics who are very good at what they're doing, looking at what the research and the evidence tells us. But actually, let's look at what veterans think. OK, so this looks like a small graph, but actually there's a couple of years work that's gone into this. And what we're looking at is the three main areas. So we're looking at combat trauma, we're looking at PTSD, and then we're looking at EMDR recovery. The first thing that I found, so in the research that I was doing, is there's this thing called the ties that bind. And what I mean by that is military has its own distinct culture, but it also has stigma. So when you leave the military, you can feel very lost, alone and isolated. But also the problem with that culture is it leaves you feeling that you can't talk about it. So we don't. So people don't seek the therapy or seek the help that they need. The second thing is that when you experience combat trauma, something happens, something changes. So you you go from being a soldier to a warrior, for want of a better description. And I was seeing this time and time again in my research. Something was happening in them and they were kind of changing. But the problem is that once that experience occurred, that kind of warrior got stuck. He didn't know how to go back or, or to stand down. Anger is the key. Now, this is a really key feature of PTSD. So what you will see is people look like they're very angry. And the problem with that emotion is that it leaves you feeling on edge, uncomfortable. You get really grumpy with your kids. You get really grumpy with the people that you love around you. And that, again, that isolates you and leaves you very alone. It makes you think that there's something wrong with you or that you're just a grumpy person. Past is present is very much talking about those key features of PTSD. So when we were looking at those four elements before, what you find is that those memories from combat are very much occurring in the same in the day to day stuff. So I've heard about people that have literally hit the deck in the middle of Tesco's because they've heard a loud noise because you're re-experiencing those events. And so it feels like you're the only person that's having these thoughts and you don't know what to do with yourself. And the fight goes on. So when we talk about that fight, it's that you fought in combat and you come back to the civilian world and now you feel like you're still fighting in that civilian world. So you've got those PTSD features, but you've also got those, that sense of I'm isolated. People don't understand. I've got to try and continue here. Now, the, the last bit is EMDR and recovery. And what I found, and I didn't realise about this, but you've got to be in it to win it. So if you come to therapy, but you're just window shopping, you're not going to get as much out of it as if you really embrace the process. So those people that do well in therapy are like, right, come on, then let's do this. But you've got to be ready to do that. And if you're not ready, that doesn't mean you're not ever going to be ready. It just means that you're not ready right now. You've got to be in it to win it. But what you'll find, my last one is that those wounds, we can heal those wounds, but you still have those scars. So we don't take those things away from you. You can't ever take away what's, you've ha what's happened because you still have those scars, but we can help you to cope with it in the future, in the present and the future. So what does this all mean? OK, there's still stigma around expressing difficult emotions and that can stop people seeking help, which is why I'm saying go and have a look on our website. There's testimonials there. It can tell you what people 
get from our therapy. People with combat trauma can feel isolated, alone and alienated. PTSD symptoms aren't always your best friend because they can make you look like you're angry, you're withdrawn, it can affect relationships, it can make you feel like you're literally just by yourself and it can keep you away from most people that you love. EMDR, it does help, but you've got to be willing to engage in the process. Again, it's about whether you're window shopping or ready to buy. And therapy will not make you forget what happened, but it can help you put it away in a safe place where it no longer causes you a problem in the here and now. And here are my details, and I've got 40 seconds left. Thank you very much. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much, Victoria. Is that record time for you? <laughs> I spoke fast. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much. So next up, uh, we have Anthony Stephen Malone, former British elite paratrooper and CIA agent turned published author, media special advisor and speaker. So Anthony is going to uh, wow us with his incredible career journey, lifting the lid on what it's like to be an undercover operative, revealing his time spent undercover inside a terrorist network as well. So please welcome Anthony Stephen Malone. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am Anthony Stephen Malone, the Rogue Warrior, former CIA agent, primary source of intelligence on locating Osama bin Laden in Pakistan. I am a British military veteran of the Parachute Regiment, fifth generation soldier, come from a military family, author of four books, including United Nations, Faces of Hope, and On a Bound rogue warrior. I spent six months, then three years undercover inside a maximum security prison in Afghanistan, Polashaki, one of the most barbaric and dangerous and dark prisons in the world. People are murdered and die there every day. It is hell on earth. Over years, I became close friends to terrorist commander Salahuddin head of operations for the Taliban and head of the Akani network. Saladin signed the peace deal in Afghanistan. At great risk to my life, I photographed, copied terrorist commanders' notebooks, cloned SIM cards and recorded conversations, audio conversations, instant death if I was caught my head would have been cut straight off. My undercover work stopped over 100 terrorist attacks in the UK and US, including IED and suicide attacks on British ISAF forces in Afghanistan and forces in Iraq. My villa in Afghanistan was my team's headquarters where, where regular meetings with senior SAS, CIA, FBI, soccer and international diplomats took place. Our intelligence also included 12 suicide bombers en route to the United Kingdom who were targeting children's schools, trains, football stadiums, Buckingham Palace, 10 Downing Street. Thank you to Colonel Bob Stewart for helping my team to hand in the report to top brass MOD Whitehall, London. At one point, branded a traitor by elements within the British government, who even tried to have me executed and discredited. American government confirmed in official correspondence to the British government that Anthony Stephen Malone, aka Allah Uddin Saeed Ahmed, terrorist commander, 
was a deep cover knock, non-official cover operative for American intelligence, who had risked his life many times to save British and American ISAF forces lives. I am a soldier, patriot, agent. I am the CIA's world war. <laughs> I've very rarely got, got to say this, but thank you for your service. And I'm obviously aware of a lot of what you've done, mate, um, even if the public don't know it, and you've done a hell of a lot. Okay? Well, thank well, you, and I appreciate that. And thank you for your service, too. Um, also, you're you're the tip of the spear. I'm I'm in the back. You're the one, you were the one who were risking your life, and and thank you more for, for your experience than, than mine, to be honest. As General David Petraeus told me in Iraq, one man can make a difference. Now, the director of Patriots, a private company who help and support British and American military veterans and personnel from all services. More needs to be done to help and support our veterans and families. Positive mindset positive can-do attitude, actions, not words. I support forces for change. Hello, everybody, if you can hear me. You can. Right. Um, I'd just like to say, Thank you for having me on here and thank you and welcome to everybody else who is involved with this very important program and the the work forces of change to help our veterans and service personnel. My background is quite 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 interesting, obviously, but uh, we're not really here to discuss all of that. I'm here to discuss the work that I do with my little company called Patriot. We are a private company that is set up by myself and another veteran, Nikki Mortimer, a former veteran of the police force of 16 years. The work that we, we do is quite small, 99% of it, we do not, we do not advertise it because we, we, we deem it necessary to obviously pr protect the identities of a lot of the veterans and the families and the children of the veterans that we also help as as well. A lot of this all started off when the homeless military veterans became a bit of a topic in the country. I wanted to see for myself what was really going on. So instead of, uh, I'd done a lot of reading, but experience is better than reading. I went down for a few days and a few weeks on some of the cities in the United Kingdom, and I lived as a homeless person with the homeless veterans on the streets. That gave me a very clear and clear cut understanding of what was necessary to help the, these individuals. At that point, we were finding them, we were feeding them, we were encouraging them, to the homeless veterans, to get off the streets and into accommodation and work. That was deemed a good success by myself and my team. During the COVID crisis, there was, at the beginning, there there was a shortage of PPE equipment and sub, sub, supplies as well. Patriot and Team Patriot, we acquired, picked up and delivered PPE equipment, thousands of items and supplies to care homes and a couple of hospitals in the United Kingdom because that was the right thing to actually do. Also in COVID, a lot of veterans and their families have been really struggling. Everyone's been finding it quite difficult. Veterans are always very, very proud and very rarely ask for help. Mm -hmm. We were contacted by members of the local local police forces and councils, informing us of some veteran families that were really struggling. We then started off what was a little project at the start of delivering some food parcels. This went on throughout COVID and we ended up dropping hundreds of food parcels every week to veterans and their families in our local communities. At Christmas time, Patriot 
And Fergie Ferguson, also a veteran who lives in Cyprus, helped us get a lot of Christmas presents for children of veterans across the United Kingdom. So last Christmas, anyone who we found out about, their children had presents to open on Christmas Day. Their freezers and their fridges were full at Christmas. It's something quite small, but it made a massive difference to a lot of the veterans out there. We have also, as Patriot, recorded a little song called Give Me a Little Love in a recording studio. It was never about making money. It was about bringing veterans together, which we did. Hundreds of veterans and supporters together in a recording studio and the children of veterans. It was a phenomenal experience and everyone thought it was it was the feel good factor of bringing veterans together. Obviously, I can't do all this by myself. So I've got regional coordinators and volunteers across the United Kingdom who help all the above happen. Some people within the veteran community are trying to divide it. Some people have got egos. That is wrong. Always remember, united we stand, divided we fall. I support forces of change. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And that's me finished a bit early. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, uh, this is wonderful. This means we've got more time to ask you questions. So none of you go anywhere. <laughs> so our next speaker is a multi award winning member of the British Armed Forces, an international best selling veteran author, you might see some books in the background, inspirational keynote speaker, founder of Tri X Forces and CEO of Triatis Global Leadership. So Samuel T. Ready, it's over to you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Emma, uh, Simon, and Hugh James for having me here today. It's a great honor for me to be talking to you uh, today. Because let's face it, 20 odd years ago, I came to this country with nothing. And living in my quarters with even the spoon that was feeding my daughter was owned by the MOD. But my father was the first police officer in a small village in Mauritius uh, to become the first police officer. And it was a great celebration. Before that, he was a shooting boy working in the field. I'm the first guy from my home country who actually became a soldier, a best-selling author, entrepreneur and beyond. But my grandfather had a bigger dream for his son. When World War II started, he enlisted to serve in North Africa. Upon his return to Mauritius, he saved his money, uh, which was about £25 a month. At the time, it was quite a big amount of money to start his first business. So he bought a boat and a, and a truck. And I remember talking with him and I was quite young about his time in the army. And the pictures were, you know, with very pointy, ugly looking vehicles and pointy weapons at the time. And everything, all of that didn't make sense to me. But the funniest thing of all is, I, didn't, I couldn't remember at the time whether he could actually drive the truck or navigate the boat. But uh, that is something I never found out in the end. But the, the thing is, from a very young age, from my summertime in Mauritius, I'll be with him and we will go at sea to extract sand to make cement and do concrete. And we will be uh, selling them to builders. And that in itself was my first lesson of leadership and entrepreneurship. Now, the story I'm telling you today is probably just one in a million. There's been Commonwealth serving in the armed forces since World War II. We have the Fijian, the 50,000 Fijians served in, North, uh, in Normandy. Uh, the first Commonwealth uh, was a Fijian uh, that was uh, awarded the Victoria Cross. But the, all of us that come to the UK serve the armed forces. We come to serve the armed forces for a reason. Whether that is your grandfather, these, the way that they were ruled by the colonies, but the way they find themselves attached to the UK, uh, 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 UK, I mean, England, Wales, Scotland, and obviously Northern Ireland. And, but my batch today, uh, most of the people that join with me are probably W2, W1, and so even officers. And probably it's the first time in history of the armed forces that we've seen so many 
black and Asian ethnic minority people at senior level. But let's face it, are you a corporal, colonel or general? At some time in life, your career will end. And, and that's a very sad fact because for most of us, when you join the armed forces, you join a, it's more than a, than, than a job, it's a lifestyle where your personal life and your professional are very closely blend together. You work with people from different ranks and different nationalities. I got to meet many people from over 12, 15 countries in my time serving. The thing is, people from the armed forces are connected together. But the sad fact is, transitioning from the armed forces is never straightforward. And the, the main reason for that is because people from, whether you're Commonwealth or not, there are so many uh, transitions that will hurdle your next career. Coming from a uh, Commonwealth point of view, there are three main reasons that people like myself, and perhaps many people here today, would be uh, facing themselves with what I call the loss in transition. And we heard some of them today earlier. But number one is the loss in, of identity. So as a Commonwealth serving in the UK uh, for maybe 5, 10, 15, 20, 22 years, after that time, you are changing uniform. You really don't know who you are. Are you the guy from the Commonwealth? Are you now a British citizen? Are you allowed to the same right in just men that any one of your colleagues are allowed to? Or are you just a guy that came from a different country? So with that loss of transition, loss of identity, many of the Commonwealth actually do not talk about the time in the military, in the armed forces. That's purely because they have no idea how would their home country take it. Would they be happy about it? Would they be calling them names? Or will they just simply have a misinterpretation of who they are? The second problem we find is the, the lack of support system. So what, what I mean by support system is, you know, uh, we know the, the first top law of, um, of Maslow is, you, you know, the armed forces feed you, shelter you and close you. That's a system. You have the medical care, you've got the, uh, the dental care. That's all taken care of by the armed forces. Those systems have been put place, have been there for the last 400 years. And as a Commonwealth, you're also entitled to these benefits. But when you leave the system, you could find yourself out of a system and without any support. But the third problem that mostly uh, many Commonwealth, like myself, face most of the time is a lack of community support. You see, the military is a community environment. When you join the military, you join a regiment, a cap badge, a regiment, a squadron, and you have your team. You're always working in teams. Whether you're a lance corporal, corporal, sergeant, staffy, or white officer, you're always part of the mess. And people work know each other very closely. But when you walk away from it, after 5, 10, 15, 22 years, you could find yourself without a community, especially if you have been moving around. So that lack of community impacts the life of the Commonwealth coming out. It doesn't matter now, we are talking about giving them a, a passport, stop paying the visa fee. That's all good. But all these three problems remain. So I appreciate the, the gesture of the government who's currently trying to sort this out. There's a lot more to be done. You know, the government you know, with the best intention, sometimes they do get things wrong. And I have a great saying that, you know, if you have great people around you, regardless of the life you're facing, no matter how broke you are, how lost you are, or even how hard life can be, people can piece you back. And we hear today a lot of people on this platform who are doing just that. So, hence why we have created uh, Tribe Potential. Myself and my co-founder, Kul Mahe, who himself is a high-ranking uh, former police officer. We formed Tribe Potential to do three things. Number one is to help our Commonwealth and foreign uh, soldiers, about 10,000 of them, including the Gurkhas, to really gain more credibility and transition successfully from the UK armed forces. And what do we offer them is three things. Number one, we want them to use their credibility, their value, their identities to join other uniform services in the UK. 
that's the police, fire services, NHS, and prison services. So we want to take those experience that they've gained, these accumulated years of experience, and transition those back into other uniform services, which are by either promoting diversity, cognitive diversity, to really uh, uh, maximize what they have to offer to the public and by carry on serving the country. Number two, we want them to be able to really gain more credibility by taking more, by uplifting the education. Education for Commonwealth, no matter where you come from, is very important. 20 odd years later, I'm still studying. I'm not on my way to do my PhD. I'm probably never going to stop studying. And that's the one of the key functions of what we want to offer them. We have now partnered with many universities around the UK to make sure that our Commonwealth come out of the military with a degree or above. But the third thing is we want them to be able to start businesses in this country that will not just benefit the UK economy, but also benefit their home countries. We know that now that we have about 53 uh, Commonwealth serving in the UK armed forces. And I believe we are living in a time where of change and certainty but each of our Commonwealth can play a vital asset in the United Kingdom. They are the golden threat that can link all the 53 countries together in a time of post-Brexit. Thank you. Oh, Samuel, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it's honestly, it's a real pleasure to have everybody here today and it's fascinating to hear all the different areas that people specialise in. So we'll, as we said, we'll be getting into questions uh, a little bit later on. We're waiting for uh, Johnny to join us. He's going to pop up at some point. That's Johnny Mercer. And I've got a feeling it's going to be during Andrew, who's going to be speaking for us next. So uh, we have Andrew Pierce up next, uh, engagement officer from the fantastic Communities for Work Plus Port Albert team. Uh, if you're not aware about what Communities for Work Plus do, they do incredible things getting people back into work from all kinds of backgrounds. Um, we've worked with them a couple of times with The Wave and they've always been incredible and uh, great to sit radio as well. So they provide specialist employment advice, support and one-on-one mentoring and they'll be discussing courses options support available but there's nobody better to talk about it than Andrew Pierce so over to you Andrew hi everyone thanks for uh thanks for inviting me here today I'm gonna try and share my slides now so bear with me one second um first of all I'd like to uh just thank all the service men and women uh for this service this country and um to the world as well um you know we take it for granted sometimes uh, just checking. Can you see my screen? Yep, we can see it. Hi. Um, as mentioned, I'm the engagement officer for Neath Patalbot Communities for Work team, um, but we do have teams throughout South Wales. So whatever I say will be relevant in any region. Um, if any of you are out of area and would like to get in touch with us, don't be afraid to get in touch with me. And if there's anything I need to forward on to our partners in another region, I'm more than happy to do that for you guys. So um, Communities for Work. Um, what's been mentioned so far is the transition process for a lot of veterans. Uh, I had a background in the prison service and I worked with um, a lot of veterans who had transitioned to prison officers, but also worked with a lot of offenders as well, who were veterans who had kind of gone off the rails after leaving the services and, um, you know, struggled with the transition. Even though that we are not um, a niche veteran support service, our services do apply to people who might not want to leave the forces and go into a, a security background such as the police or um, the prison service. So there we go, just a quick background. Um, we're a local authority employment support programme. We're funded by the Welsh Government and our team now has followed in the footsteps of our Swansea and Gem partners where we've joined forces with all the employment support programmes in the area. So we now come under the umbrella of MPT employability. So that means then that any criteria you don't have to worry about, you can get in touch with us, refer into the project, and we will refer you then to the most relevant um, program to support you. So we can help anyone who's age 16 plus. Um, so we can we can work with veterans, we can also work with their families. Uh, we can work with people who are 16 plus all the way up to retirement age. We can help anyone who's unemployed, 
in part-time employment or looking for more hours. We can also help people who are on low wages or zero or contracts. So, like I said, we offer employment support. Um, we have mentors who help people transition and they're from the moment they get referred into the program to the end of their journey. And our mentors offer careers advice. They assist in job searching. Uh, they help with application forms. They can also tweak CVs. Um, we have people then that can help you prepare for job interviews as well. And what I'll get into later is uh, we also have funding available then to access training opportunities. So if anyone wants to change career and they need specific qualifications to get into that career, we can we can help them with that as well. Um, something else we offer as well, we have something called a barriers fund. So if someone is struggling financially and they need um, help to get to a job interview or to a training location, we can help with transport. So we can we can buy bus passes or train tickets to get to to get to the location they need to go to complete the training. Um, we can also help with uh, childcare costs. So if someone has um, issues with childcare, we can help with childcare costs then, so they can attend any training programs or even attend you know attend the first week or two of employment. And then we can also help them with funding for any PPE or equipment that's needed. Um, there we go. So our mentoring is one-to-one. Uh, -one. Uh, our mentors are there. Um, we used to meet in the community, but obviously since COVID now, there's a lot of stuff that happens via WhatsApp, uh, through Teams and you know um, over the telephone as well. We can break down barriers to help you get to employment. So that means that um, because we're a local authority uh, program, we have links to other departments within the local authority. So if someone needs help with, with housing, we can pick up a phone, contact someone from housing. We can also refer them for any more specialized support, such as mental health, substance misuse. We have partners and uh, people that can assist us with that. Um, we can help with confidence building. I've already mentioned the funding for training opportunities. Um, we offer regular support and upskill to find work, so we can even uh, provide training courses for some of the skills um, as well. That'll kind of bulk out your CV and help with anything that um, bolsters like a main qualification. Um, like I said, the CVs offer general advice and guidance. We also have a team of employment liaison officers who have direct links with local businesses, so they actually actively seek out jobs. So they'll contact a mentor. Um, mentor will say, I've got a certain individual who's looking for a job in construction, just for an example. They'll contact local construction uh, firms then to see if there's any vacancies. We can also um, provide access then to any kind of volunteering or work experience opportunities. So what to expect from us? We are experienced staff from all different backgrounds. Um, with people like you guys, we've all come from various backgrounds from different spectrums of the community. Um, we're friendly and supportive, um, and we, we work with you to identify any areas for development, like I said, and overcome any barriers. Uh, just a little bit more on the training opportunities. Um, we have links with training providers uh, throughout Wales, so we can get qualifications in construction such as CSCS, CCNSG. Uh, if someone does want to go into security, we can help with SIE licenses. We provide qualifications in care. Uh, customer service, basic admin IT, and cleaning qualifications as well. Um, and there's our contact information. So if you do want to get in touch with us, you can just text the word work to double six triple seven and we'll get back to you. There's email addresses there. Uh, you can contact us as well as phone numbers. But if you need to contact me directly to discuss anything, uh, my email address is a.ps at npt.gov.uk. Um, and I'd just like to say again, thank you all uh, for your service. People in the armed forces, uh, we owe you a lot. And that's about me done, I think. I did uh, have a video, but I can't play it on my computer. It's up to you guys if you've got time to play it. If not, it's no problem. You can also yeah. find us on Facebook as well. Um, each Communities for Work team has set up a Facebook page in a specific area. So if you type in Communities for Work, you can get in touch with us through Facebook as well. Thank you, Andrew. I didn't know if the girls could play the video their end first. I'm just waiting to confirm. Yeah, we can. Christy will we'll show it now. Great.
If you're unemployed and looking for work, Neath Port Talbot Communities for Work Plus is here to help you. If you are 16 or over, living in Neath Port Talbot, working part-time or low hours, not in employment, education or training, and looking for help to find employment, get in touch. Last year, our team of advisors and mentors helped almost 250 people back into employment by helping them develop skills, gain qualifications and build confidence. Sign up with MPT Communities for Work Plus and you will receive one-to-one -one support from a mentor who will help with CV writing, prepare you for interviews, offer advice and guidance along with offering employment and training opportunities. We can also offer funding to reduce any barriers you have such as transport, clothing and childcare costs. Our support is totally flexible as you can leave at any time. You can also receive support from the comfort of your own home with our virtual appointments by phone, text or video call. It's quick and easy to get in touch. You have nothing to lose but a lot to gain. For more information, please contact us. Oh, excellent. So that's Communities for Work Plus. And a special thank you to Andrew there. Thank you so much for taking the time out with us today. And uh, just to say, as, as you've noticed, we've got 10 minutes per person speaking. So it's a, a very sort of shortened idea of what our speakers do. There's so much more that they do. And we're, we're just having a little snippet. So we'll be asking some questions at the end as well. Uh, our final speaker is Johnny Mercer MP, former Minister for Defence, People and Veterans. 13 years of service with the British Army, rising to the rank of captain, three tours of Afghanistan. And Mr Mercer says it's important to deliver on promises and make sure veterans are looked after properly. He's now campaigning vigorously and will tell us about the issues that matter most to him. Please welcome uh, Johnny Mercer MP. Thank you. Hi guys, how are you doing? Can you hear me all right, uh, Claire? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yeah, good. Brilliant. Thanks so much for having me uh, for having me on this morning uh, and inviting me to uh, to speak with you. I, I just I'll just be sort of brief in my remarks. And then really, I think uh, I'm happy to sort of take questions. I think uh, um, people being able to sort of um, ask a couple of questions, I think, would be really helpful in this space. But look, firstly, I just want to say a huge thank you to all of you who do so much to help veterans. Um, there is, you know, it, it's indisputable that. Uh, the single biggest factor that improves the life chances of any veteran leaving the service is having a job. And uh, some of our companies and some of the ones that have been highlighted this morning, um, you know, absolutely go the extra mile to try and uh, uh, help these guys resettle into civilian life when they uh, when they come out of the military. And, you know, people like me are hugely grateful. I, I just sort of make a lot of noise and try and get the government to do the right thing new people are actually sort of working in this space every day uh, it requires a real sort of patience and diligence and duty and uh, and professionalism and uh, I, i'm incredibly grateful for for everything you do um where are we in the veteran space in this country i think that uh, you know we continue to grind on i think that uh, we have uh, made made progress i, th I think it would be completely unfair to say that we haven't made progress um but i think we have made progress uh, and I think that, uh, and I think that, um, you know, we uh, we have, you know, the Prime Minister set this ambition about this country being the best uh, country in the world to be a veteran. Um, I, I think we we have we do have to sort of change course in order to achieve some of that stuff. Um, I think that, uh, um, you know, we uh, when it comes to um, promises to our veterans, which has been a bit of a problem for me over the last uh, couple of months. Uh, I think it's really important in this space that if you're going to finally address these issues, you need to uh, make sure that uh, you follow through on what you said you'd do. Um, and that obviously has been a bit of a, a snag for me when I, I was working in government. I felt like I couldn't do it anymore. Um, and, and now I'm campaigning hard from the outside to make sure we realise those promises. So, um, look, I think that uh, um, there are now better opportunities for veterans coming out of the military than there ever have been before. I think <clears throat> lots of uh, civilian companies and lots of great people like Emma working uh, in your organisation really do go the extra mile to make this stuff happen. Um, <clears throat> but I think if I could ask just just one thing, I think it would be, um, and it's my ask of government and the Prime Minister and everybody else, is about, how, you know, 
going from looking at this space in that how much do we kind of put into it here's all the opportunities here's the money here's this you know what are veterans complaining about to really trying to understand like what it is like to go through that system at the moment what it's like to leave the forces today what it's like to try and access mental health care if you're poorly um, and if we can turn the telescope around like that and really look at it from the service leavers point of view um, i think that we will um uh, really a achieve change in this space but uh, um, a huge thank you for everything you're doing um, and, and I'm more than happy to to take a few questions or anything from anybody basically on, uh, on on anything I've said or indeed anything that you've seen over the last couple of years that you'd like me to expand on. Oh thank you Johnny um, we've lost your camera I just what? Want to see. <laughs> you've disappeared. <laughs> you can't see me. Oh you're there now you're there now. <laughs> I haven't changed anything. <laughs> it's funny. I think you're God, probably... I, I think I think I've bored my own camera. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Uh, so what we're doing, Johnny, is we're going to ask uh, everybody questions. We know you're quite busy, and I know you have to. Um, you've got all events happening because you've got a busy couple of days ahead. So we do have questions for all the panel. So even if I do direct uh, a question at a particular panel member, please feel free. If anybody else has the answer or would like to offer an answer or an alternative answer, please do step in and, and, um, and answer the questions. So, for example, our first question uh, for you, Johnny. Uh, when is there likely to be more support for veteran friendly employers to take more ex service personnel on after leaving? So I think I think there's a, a great deal in that space at the moment that is is kind of not not particularly well advertised by the MOD um, uh, and by the cabinet office who are actually responsible for government uh, veterans affairs. Um, you know that there is support there. I think the um, the uh, employment recognition scheme is really good. I think uh, uh, those who sign the Armed Forces Covenant is is fantastic. But for me, it was always about kind of improving the experience for everybody uh, in that space. Not, you know, so the Armed Forces Covenant is is great and it's great that companies sign that. But I think it would be <clears throat> fair to say that not everybody, every company that holds on to the Armed Forces Covenant uh represents it in the same way and so what i was trying to do certainly when i was in government was to legislate to sort of have a minimum standard if you like uh for those who are coming out uh to make sure that you cannot be in law you cannot be discriminated against uh for your service um and uh, and move that forward uh you know in the years to come so the armed forces covenant bill that's coming through is going to make it unlawful for um uh for local authorities to discriminate against service personnel in the areas of health housing and education that is just a start point um but i think all of these things that there's not a kind of single arrow that you can fire into this problem um and make it better it's it's about highlighting best practice it's about making it as easy as possible for um for companies to employ veterans and you know that that speaks to the space of um the transition program and making sure that uh uh, you know, qualifications are correctly transposed across and things like that. Um, but also employers understanding really what they're getting when they get a veteran. And, you know, there is a narrative out there, I'm afraid, that, uh, you know, all veterans are sort of mad, bad and dangerous to know. And actually, the reality is completely different. I mean, personally, I think you're getting, you know, uh, twice the individual uh, for if you employ a veteran. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to go out and make sure that everybody sort of thinks the same thing in that space. Oh, thank you, Johnny. Um, this question is open for all of the panel, so please feel free. I know we've got some uh, real experts on, on this subject. So what are the panel's thoughts on the closure of Health for Heroes and combat stress? Do they feel respite-based therapy care is vital for those at risk of ending their lives? Their lives. And to the panel. I can, I can say something about that, if that's helpful. So we, so in Veterans NHS Wales, we're all Wales. The evidence tells us that actually being able to access our care is more effective than residential care. So they did a study back in, I think it was 2014, Rosemary Kennedy, where the Welsh Government asked them to look specifically at residential care. And the evidence they found was that it was better to stick to community-based care. And in fact, that's for all people. It's better to keep people in the community or offering them care rather than bringing them into um, a residential care.
Do you want me to say anything on that? If you'd like to, yes, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, um, Victoria, I, th I think, was that Victoria, was it? Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. Great. Look, Victoria's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Okay, we, you know, the, the, the evidence will tell you in this space that you get better outcomes for our people, which is what we have to be ruthlessly committed to, I'm afraid, when, when that care is in the community. And, and the truth is, with respite centres, is that they do provide a treatment path, if you like, but they are not the best and most effective treatment path. And, and that is uh, borne out by the evidence through King's College for Mental Health and various studies, the people like Victoria working in this every single day. Um, so it's not a question of, you know, the government's kind of closing these centres, right? The, the government has a, um, you know, as everyone knows, I'm no real staunch defender of the government, but, um, you know, they do have a responsibility to ensure that where um, where, where care is, is needed, it, it is available. And I think that there is a transition going on at the moment because what you've seen is the real growth of people like Help for Heroes, the Hidden Wounds Programme, Combat Stress. Um, and as, you know, and as um, giving to these charities have gone down because of the way operations are now, and we're not seeing the scenes of Whitton Bassett and things like that, actually you're seeing demands kind of increase, right? Because, because of the effects of these, these uh, conflicts. And what we're at is a kind of nexus. And what I was trying to do was pull up the government to provide the fund and the resources to people like Victoria to make sure that we have a clear treatment pathway for people on the NHS. But actually, there's a role for everyone because some of those NHS services are delivered by combat stress. Some of them are delivered by Help for Heroes in the in the northwest and places like that. We've got three clear treatment pathways now in the NHS around Op Courage, which is uh, which is the the sort of overall broad name for this stuff. Um, the real challenge is 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 getting people to access that care properly. And uh, and for me, the, the the you know the battleground, if you like, is I don't think I, any GP surgery in this country should not be veteran aware. I don't know why they wouldn't be uh, accredited in that space. Uh, any NHS trust that receives millions of pounds in public money should be um, should be veteran friendly. I don't want to go to another hospital and someone tells me they don't know what op courage is. Um, who works there for me that you know that's just not good enough um, there are brilliant people in the NHS who work in this space and, and we need to make sure they're empowered have the resource um, to get on and deliver it oh brilliant thank you Johnny um, there, there's one more question as well specifically for you Johnny um, it says I lost out on my learning credits as I got dates wrong with Covid is there any way I can get them back um, so um, if you uh, write into uh, the MOD, a lot. I mean, I know that a lot of stuff was changed around COVID, so there were longer um, qualifying periods, um, and um, you know, gateways were moved. I couldn't comment on your case specifically, but definitely write into them, um, and you'll get a proper ministerial response, and that should help you. If you don't get anywhere, then then email me, and I'll try and help you as well. I think that's the important thing that we take away from today is that everybody here is available to be contacted, aren't they? This is this is the important thing. So should should you need any extra advice, please reach out to the people who are on this call. Um, if if you forget maybe who was on the call and you, you need to be put in touch with a specific person, please get in touch with us at The Wave. Emma Grant, who is our news editor, who does all of the veteran stuff in her spare time, like a, a superhero herself. Um, Emma knows absolutely the ins and outs of absolutely everything. So if people need to contact the radio stations, please do. We can put you in touch with anybody on this call with the help that you do actually need as well. Okay. Um, I do apologise. There's a Tim Tim Penny on the call. Could you could you turn your camera off? Is that okay? <laughs> I do apologise, Tim. <laughs> Lovely to see your face. I'm um, rude. <laughs> okay. I'll turn it off now. Apologies. Oh no, no, no problem. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So uh this question, uh, I think this is aimed at Anthony or possibly Johnny, maybe some others can uh chip in as well. So this person has suggested that veteran care in the US is actually better than the UK. Uh, they said, thank you so much for all your service um, with Anthony's contact in America and Johnny's background in the military, as well as politics. Is there a way we can get help from America to get better veteran care? Oh, you mute, you mute, Anthony. I'll quickly jump in and say and speak for about about a minute about this. Um, 
the American establishment and the people who are white who are writing the white papers over there are in the process of getting all that together and that will be handed to the British establishment. Um, Johnny, Johnny Mercer, I'll make sure that you receive a copy of all of that as well. We should have it all together within about a week's time. These are the white papers in Washington, America, that helped to form government policy over there. They, they're not perfect. They are trying. They've made some mistakes, but they've learned from them as well. And I believe that we can learn a little bit from how they deal with their veterans and veteran issues in America as well. So the people who have written these papers for, for the White House, we are receiving a copy of them. So I'll get there, the Johnny and the, and obviously our, our establishment as, as well on that one. Johnny, would you like to say something? Yeah, well, I, th thanks for that, Auntie. I appreciate it. And I uh, look forward to reading them. I mean, what I would say in this space is that um, we absolutely could learn things from uh, the Americans um, in, in what they do and certainly their attitude towards it. Right. I mean, they went through this really dark period after Vietnam. They've got things like the GI Bill, which looks at things like education and training as well. We wouldn't want to sort of lift and shift the whole thing. Um, you know, they are dealing with a, uh, a a problem at much greater scale. They don't have things like the NHS. We don't want to create sort of little subsections of society where you've got veterans. You want to create good citizens who have served, which is, you know, why we treat people in the NHS. Um, but there are definitely things we could learn from them. Uh, I think it's an ever evolving picture. They have some specific real challenges uh, there. For example, their veteran uh, suicide uh, issue is, is genuinely an epidemic. Uh, 22 veterans a day um, are taking their own life in the US at the moment, which is extraordinary. Um, so I, I think we all amongst the Five Eyes community have to um, have to try and understand um, the challenges, what it's really like to try and resettle after a period like Afghanistan and Iraq um, so that we can provide best services for those who've served. Excellent. Thank you so much, both. So, um, um, it, 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 just a quick one. See Ian, third battalion Royal Welsh, Captain Ian Moore. Hello. Good afternoon, yes, Johnny. Uh, lovely to hello, meet you. Um, good afternoon. I have an answer to the question on regarding enhanced learning credits because I'm flicking between this yes, meeting and the Defence Net. So there we are. And the, the direct quote is, changes to the enhanced learning credit, further education and higher education schemes came into effect from the 31st of March, uh, sorry, the 30th of March, 2021. Access to the enhanced learning credit scheme and FEHE schemes has been extended to 10 years for veterans who left the armed forces between April 2011 and the 31st of March 16. Both dates are inclusive. I hope that helps the gentleman or whoever answered the question. Good answer. I wish I was that clever. Captain Ian Moore is on it. And, and we've got a question for you now, if, if you don't mind, Ian. Um, so somebody's asked, what is the most important task you've completed? I th um, in all honesty, I think I alluded it to, uh, to it when I, when I was talking. Um, in the in the mid noughties uh, the, the the process of uh, informing our families uh, and our service personnel of either loss or uh, like I said the ultimate sacrifice or uh, injury uh, was not a good system it, it was quite impersonal uh, it was quite um, difficult um, it was rooted in old fashioned stiff up the lip um, policy. Um, and over a period of time, myself and a, and a group of others who were sadly involved with families, we were called together and, and, and asked uh, how we could how we could improve that uh, that system. And um, we got uh, families uh, involved who who'd sadly lost loved ones. And one particular lady um, I, I dealt with, her name is Cheryl. She's a, 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 a mother of a, a soldier that was died who was only 19 years old. Uh, and we got to the um, uh, the airhead in, as it was then, um, RAF Lynham. And the aircraft had come in and her son's coffin was brought off the back of the plane. Um, and, and procedurally, you know, you stand in the tent, you watch the coffin come off the back of the plane. Uh, it's put into the back of a hearse and then he goes off to the coroner in Oxford. Um, 
unbeknown to me, Cheryl had other ideas. She grabbed my hand. Uh, she walked me across the tarmac in front of all the two, three, and four-star people that were in the in the tent. Uh, she touched the coffin and said, "Son, you're home safe." We then turned around, walked back. Um, after the uh, pro uh, the the process had finished, because uh, there were a number of uh, sadly casualties that day. Um, the, the RAF staff officer at, uh, at Lynham, um, I, I spoke to him, I said, sir, I had no idea that was going to happen. Um, but, you know, what what can we do about this? It's the first time they see their loved ones when they come back from uh, from wherever they've been. And he said, perhaps we should give them some time. Uh, and within a few weeks, um, they had decided to put a small chapel of rest in Lynham. And the families were then uh, given the opportunity to have uh, some time with their loved ones um, before they went off to the coroner's office in, uh, in, in Oxford. So it's individuals like Cheryl uh, and other families all around the United Kingdom who sadly paid the ultimate sacrifice, who now live in the community. With that, uh, with that pain and suffering, as as we said, that you know you, you can heal the wounds, but the scars are still there. Uh, and something that small, uh, it makes a world of difference to people. And I think that's probably one of the. It, it always sticks in my mind that that event. And um, at the time, I thought my 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 career was ended. But you know, uh, prag the, the pragmatic view was taken of it, and we improved the system. So that that's that's probably the the, the um, yeah one of the one of the big things I've ever done. An incredible standout moment. I think, um, so when this person asks, what's the most important task you've completed, um, would you want to answer Samuel as well? For myself, okay. Uh, I think uh, the um, most amazing work we've done so far is taking someone who was a chef in the British Army for 22 years and place him into an organization when he's now uh, a manager of a, of a private school and looking after all the, the catering services. And that is just an, an idea of what I believe is, is what I call the levers to leaders. He's taking what you have gained from the armed forces, repackage it. Obviously there was a process to that. We took him, we put him first on a cruise ship for two weeks. So I live in Southampton, there's a lot, lot of cruise ships around here. So we put him on a cruise ship for two weeks where he was working and, and non-paid, but you know, gaining experience. From then we redesigned his, his CV to feature the cruise ship itself, the work he did on the cruise ship. And from then he obviously left, uh, you know, he was working in a pub, uh, you know, living as a W1, earning, uh, uh, going back to earning 25 grand. And all of a sudden we managed to, working through a process where he's now back on 45 grand a year. So I think that was a pretty, pretty big job. So he took a, a lot of effort from, from connecting the right individual, right companies, get them to believe about the, the capacity of this guy, who's not just a chef, you know, people know chef as flipping burgers, you know, but these guys at, at some point in his career served uh, a lot of people in Iraq uh, at their daily meals. So, so that was the, the transition we did with him. It's incredible. Yeah, absolutely incredible. I just wanted to confirm as well. Um, Andrew Pierce, Community for Works Plus. We mentioned earlier, we, we said uh, Nico Talbot came up a lot with Communities for Work Plus, but it's all of Wales, isn't it? I just wanted to definitely confirm that. Yeah, yeah, we got teams throughout Wales. Um, we're Welsh Government funded and each local authority runs their own Communities for Work project, but we, we link up with each other as well. So like I said, we fall under MPT employability. Uh, we've got another team men who fall under Swansea working and Bridgend employability as well is just on the road and there's teams and throughout Wales. So yeah, if they if they get in touch with me, send any details over to me, then I can forward it to the relevant team. Man. That's no problem. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Andrew. Um, no one question that's come in and um, this is open to all the panel. So please feel free if people want to to chip in and give an answer on this one. Um, and I'm sure somebody uh, did mention it a little bit. It may have been Anthony. Uh, somebody's asked, why aren't we all working together? Um, I, I'll, I'll just jump again in, uh, Ian. Um, there's a couple of organisations in Wales now um, that are grouping themselves together to apply for grants and i get i completely understand what uh, what the um the question is aimed at because there is a lot of stove piping if we can remove that stove piping and get groups together like this meeting does it brings us together um 
to a sort of single point where we can take a single issue forward um, with a big group of people. It's much better than small little groups trying to do it, um, uh, do it all differently. So my suggestion is if you are aware of other groups in your area, come together as a greater force because our greater force will probably be, um, be much better. Uh, in the wider scheme of things, uh, there are big organizations out there that are lot, doing lots of big things um, but the little organizations, perhaps they could get together and become a big organization and then they'll be able to push it forward as well with the same force. Can I also add as well that in Veterans NHS Wales, we work in the NHS, but we run clinical network meetings where we get everyone in the area together so that they can all share what they're doing. We get new people coming into the area that we bring them along to the meeting. So everybody's working together, knowing what everyone does. So I know quite a few names on this. Um, meeting today because of the clinical network meeting. So we are trying to work together. And that's very much what we aim to do. Yeah, it sounds like people are trying to work together and it's just, it's doing things like this, isn't it? And as you said there, Victoria, bringing people together. Um, okay, so this is a, this is a little, a little bit of a long question. I'll try and just break it down just a tiny bit. Um, so this is open to the panel. So with the defense cuts, and the size of our armed forces being decreased, greater responsibilities and pressure is being put on those currently serving. This could be a risk of creating even further mental health problems for active duty and service leavers in the future. There seems to be a real stigma around mental health. Uh, and this person would like to hear the panel's views and insight on this and possibly any personal experiences of it. Shall I go? If you can, yes, please. <laughs> so um, it's always awkward, isn't it, when you ask people online for an answer and everyone pretends their machine doesn't work. Um, look, uh, I think that uh, government cuts. You know, I, I think that's a slightly. Um, the, the reality is the money. The money is is get, There's more money going to MAD at the minute. Uh, I accept that numbers are reducing, and I have my own views on that. Um, I would say, um, you know, I, I would align myself a lot with, with what I've said already, which is that there are there is some very, very good mental health provision in this country. OK, and there are people who strive day and night to try and understand what the requirement is and to try and address um, very poorly individuals with very complex mental health problems. Um, the challenge is 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 those pathways right and and getting that leadership into the space that where you know it's, it's, it's no good if i know where to turn or you know where to turn it's the guy who left three five years ago who's on his own in in plymouth who uh, doesn't know someone like me or somebody else from the veterans community um and is unwell how do we make design a system where they know absolutely unequivocally and without doubt where they can turn for help when they need it and that that is the the challenge in this space so yes of course i will always argue for more resource and you know sometimes we are missing our our, our waiting times on, on things like uh, iapt uh, and um um the three uh the three pathways that make up our courage and I, I will always argue for more money in that space but that's not the critical ground the critical ground is really understanding why are we still in a place where an individual can go and make a video to their wife and kids saying there is no help available and then take their own life when you can go on Google and find all the help that is available in the local area? I've had that experience. OK, I've sat down with someone's wife and child and seen one of the, you know, and, and talked about one of these videos where the guy has said, look, there's no help available. And there is, and, and then I've been like, well, there is this help available in that area. So, you know, how do we, we have to understand why that's still taking place um, and what we need to do differently to be able to inject the help um, at the right time that people genuinely need it. That's the challenge at the moment. Um, and uh, certainly that's what I and a lot of others are focused on in this space. space. John is absolutely right. Um, in Op Courage is all about England and so in Wales we have veterans NHS Wales we don't miss our targets we are on target um, and we are 
always, the reason I'm doing this today, and we are always looking to increase our numbers, increase our referrals and make sure people are aware of us. But we do that through the third sector charities. So people like Joe DeLacy, I don't know who's on this call today, and Alabama Homes, Veterans Homes. So it's about those people saying to the veterans out there, do you know about Veterans NHS Wales? You can come to and have a chat with them. They're OK. They will see you. They will be able to help you. And that's part of the work that you're talking about. It's about recognising and helping them to recognise that they can get that help. But it's it's not through the professionals telling them that. It's about other people, their peers telling them that. So that is a really important point, that the biggest change we can make mm -hmm is society as a whole recognising that this is not like a hobby horse for people like Emma or Victoria or other who, others who've tuned in today. This is the nation's responsibility to her veterans. And we all have a duty to make sure that when they are poorly, they know where to turn. And that is the biggest change we could make. Um, mm -hmm. And that I accept that is in attitude, right? And that's why I keep beasting the prime minister and the government because it's actually their responsibility. It's not, it's not mine. I believe passionately in it, but they are the government and, and, and it is the nation's responsibility to look after these people. And, you know, the effect that will have on, on the community who, you know, sometimes them going around and having to like beg for care, uh, it, you know, makes everything even worse. You know what I mean? Because there's people like the individuals on this call today who are absolutely passionate about this. And if they bump into you, they've landed on their feet. The problem is if they go to a GP surgery in Plymouth or in Manchester, and there's no one like you there, and they're told, well, you know, there's a huge waiting list and op courage. I mean, what is that? You know, for me, that is the, the bit we need to iron out. Um, and that, you know, and, and that's what I, I'm, I'm focused on. I would like to jump in there for a Please second as well. Me. Right, on, on on this one, I'm going to revert back to the Americans, the American government and the veteran affairs over there as well. I've been privy to read some of the white, the white paper being prepared at the moment. And they, they are coming at it on multiple angles, very similar to what we do in the United Kingdom. But they're also looking into the options of looking after their soldiers and treating their service personnel well. They, while they're in there, in particularly while they're on operations and in theatre, they're, they're, they're looking at helping soldiers' mental health while not just while they're still serving, while they are on operational deployments. The, the example I have is any weapon on the battlefield is well maintained, oiled, it has to do the job. The soldier's mental health is exactly the same if it's sharper well taken care of well looked after it performs at a hundred percent capacity it's very important i think that the british establishment start looking at how the americans are implementing this on the battlefield during operations because if we're waiting for a soldier to have problems then leaving the forces it's too late at that point, he already has a problem. Why don't we, and why doesn't the British government look into helping soldiers while they are not just serving, while they're on op op operations? It helps cure a lot of the problems. So in five, 10, 20 years time, we're actually able to make some headway into the problems that we have with mental health and veterans in the United Kingdom. Uh, we'd like to pass this one back to G Johnny, please. Look, I, I think it's a, it's a it's a really important point. I think, you know, I don't, I don't know um, your service, Anthony, but certainly from from when I started, I think the work that goes into uh, people whilst they are serving has come on leaps and bounds. I mean, it used to be appalling, right? And it has come on um, quite a long way. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. Um, there are, you know, there's still a job of work to be done in this space to make sure that guys and girls are like genuinely mentally equipped to deal with the challenges of the service, but of leaving. And the earlier you can get in there and do that um, and make them think all the time, you know, because when you're young, you think, oh, I'm going to be in the military forever and, you know, the rest of it. Actually think about when they're going to leave. And, you know, leaving is normal. Like the civilian world is normal. Being in the military is not normal. 
it's a deeply privileged environment with you know pretty uh, fit motivated people who want to be there real life is not like that um and you know we have to be slightly sort of more savvy and a bit less naive i think about um how we're preparing people to come out of the military i mean uh, if i can mention some of the uh, the, the current uh, training for soldiers right from the junior level on entry uh, right through the ch uh, and up to the chain of command at various levels of uh, of interaction um uh, there's an incredible program in the, in the army now. It's called Op Smart um, and mental resilience training. A lot of that is delivered by young junior NCOs um, about their experiences with um, mental resilience, uh, mental health issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's delivered to to the younger element uh, with the uh, older element, overviewing it and understanding it and realizing that potentially um, there are people that now join the military that aren't perhaps as resilient. Uh, they haven't bent and, uh, you know, fell over and cut their knees as often as us old farts have. And um, they, they, and they also have a, a much better awareness of mental health now than when I joined a long, long time ago, when I, when I left the valleys a long, long time ago. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's much more of an awareness. And I'm, I hope uh, after I retire now that the people that come out after they are much better prepared. And I mean, Johnny's alluded it to, uh, to it already. We are way ahead now compared to what we were many years ago. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Ian. And um, it's, it's we, we've just run a little bit over, but I just wanted to ask really quickly, Samuel, there's a question for you. And um, I'm not sure, possibly, Andrew, if you could uh, hop in on the end of this as well. But uh, the question, Samuel, says, I was medically discharged in 2001. I want to get back into work, but no civvy skills to get an appropriate wage. What's your advice? OK, first of all, um, as we just heard earlier from Ian, the, the world has changed. That's 20, that's 20 years ago, right, 2001. So if you have left uh, that long ago, and I would very, I would love to know uh, what you've been doing for the last 20 years, because I'm not worried about the time you you, you serve in the, in the armed forces anymore. I'm looking up at the time you've been out. And I have three things about that is, you gain more experience by exposing yourself to a new environment. Doesn't matter who you are, I've had the same thing for the last 20 years of my life. I've always exposed myself to a new environment, and that's how you progress regardless of who you are. So for that uh, person in, in question, I would say, well, the world has changed. You know, we are talking behind screen now. You can start a business. You can start something from, from your home, from your kitchen. You know, I, during this lockdown, formed two companies, one in Mauritius, the team I haven't never met yet. There's 40 of them now and try potential. So there is a lot of things you can do nowadays. And, and if, the, if you uh, want to know what you can do, I can give you so many examples how you can actually, not just when working in the UK, but you can use your skill and your potential to do something globally. Because let's get that right. The world is smaller now. Anything that's happening across the world is affecting us today. So we can not just work in the UK anymore, but we can work internationally. So there's a way out. And I can show you that way. It's, it's there. Everyone knows it's there nowadays that the world has become smaller and we can work now internationally. Uh, but I'm sure Andrew has a lot more to say about that. <laughs> uh, I think you covered some really good points there. I think um, one of the biggest things is when you come out of any career, especially in the armed forces or uh, we've seen it with police officers and I added when I left the prison service, you've got a very niche set of skills. So sometimes you, you need certain qualifications to make yourself more employable. But don't take for granted your transferable skills and your experience as well, especially in something like the armed forces. And there's a lot of skills there, which you might not necessarily think would be applicable to find a job now. But I guarantee you that an employer wants someone who's going to be disciplined, on time, organised, uh, who's going to be well-mannered and, and hard-working, you know, which are all kind of transferable skills that definitely come from a career in like the military. And then it's about looking for maybe, you know, little qualifications you could do online where it would just give you that qualification to make it more employable. Um, speaking from my own experience, when I left the prison service, I had loads of um, qualifications in like mental health, but it was very niche. And, you know, it was, was in-house training within the prison service. For what I had to do personally then was just do some online courses where I transferred that knowledge very easily just to get a couple of qualifications, which enabled me then to become more employable in a kind of job role and other job roles I've applied for. So it's 
you know, you're not starting from scratch. You've got a really good foundation to work on, but it's focusing it in the right direction. So my advice would be to get in touch with an employment support program like ourselves, call into the job centre and try and speak to a careers advisor that can kind of maybe push you in the right direction. And um, like Sam said as well, you know, don't rule out self-employment. You know, it's one of our, something I didn't mention in the presentation, but we've also had people set up their own businesses by providing them with the training. Um, same post on the mend of people like Business Wales and local um, enterprise hubs that help people specifically sign up and get qualified in self-employment, learn about accounting and stuff. You know, the world's your right you just got to focus your energy in the right place, I suppose. Oh, incredible. Thank you so, so much. Um, it's been an absolute eye opener. We've tried to pack it as much as we could in such a short time. We're so grateful to our panelists for hanging on just that little bit longer for us as well. We're very, very grateful. Um, everybody, thank you. Uh, in, and and please thank, join me in thanking Victoria Williams, Captain Ian Moore, MBE, Samuel T. Reddy, Andrew Pierce from Communities Work Plus. We've got Anthony Stephen Malone as well and Johnny Mercer, MP. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we want to say a huge thank you again to our sponsor, Hugh James Solicitors. Without you, we wouldn't be able to do it. So thank you, Simon, for being here today. Um, a special thank you to Emma Grant, who is our person on the ground for all this, our news editor, who takes care of all, well, it's it's all in her spare time. She does all her, her veterans work and is our network person for this kind of thing. And uh, we're just really grateful for your time. But everybody in the forces, the service that you do, uh, here around the world, everything that you've done, part of our panel as well. We're so grateful for you. We're so thankful. And we want to let you know that the help is there. The advice is there. Please reach out to The Wave if you need to speak to Emma and she can put you in touch with any of our panelists today. Or, of course, you can reach out personally, as every single panel member has said, which is so wonderful to hear that um, everybody here is easily um, attainable for that information and advice. So uh, to our panel, uh, to, to our forces again, everybody who served, we are eternally grateful. So thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. <laughs>